May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable unto thee, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. On Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, we get that great narrative of the nativity of Jesus Christ from St. Luke. Today, we get St. John's Gospel, which spells out the significance and the implications of all that is related in Luke's story. As you'll remember, the passage includes this strange line. The passage from Luke includes this line. But Mary kept all these things, pondering them in her heart. Tradition has it that Mary, the mother of Jesus, lived with John for the rest of her earthly life after Jesus himself entrusted her to John from the cross. And so it seems that this fourth gospel, which is almost certainly the last to be written, probably contains in part the ponderings of the one who knew Jesus from his very conception. Whereas the other gospel writers begin their stories within human history, St. John insists that to understand the story of Jesus properly, one must begin at the beginning, at the very beginning. And so he begins his narrative with that that same phrase, um, although in Greek, as as the Torah begins with, in the beginning. But John is not simply cribbing from the Old Testament. He is going beyond it. The book of Genesis tells us what God did in the beginning of creation. John tells us something about what God was before creation. And what John tells us is a great development from the Jewish thought in which he was trained. The scripture sometimes speaks of wisdom as if it were a person with God, whom God sends to help men who seek him. And the Greek word logos, which roughly translates to word, was an appropriate way to refer to the same sort of idea, that wisdom or reason, right, at the center of the universe, with God at the beginning. But a good Jew would never have taken such a passage literally to mean that there was another distinct person who was divine. That in the Jewish mind, that would destroy the whole point of his monotheistic religion. So here is John saying that not only was the word with God in the beginning... Not only was it a divine attribute which can be personified in a literary way and spoken of in a figure of speech as a separate entity, instead he actually says that this divine word, the Logos, actually is a distinct person who shares the same divine nature as God. He has life in himself. He doesn't receive it from God like we do. It's just in him. And the life that is in the Logos, or the Word, is the only light standing between us and total darkness. It allows us to see what is true, both in ourselves and all around us. And as soon as we have sort of wrapped our minds around this idea that there is another divine person with God from the beginning, we find that there is more. This person, who is the Word, who is somehow equal to God, who has existed eternally with God, didn't just remain some cosmic divine being. The one through whom all things were created is now a creature himself. The word became flesh 
and dwelt among us. He wasn't flesh to begin with, but he became flesh. Now, we, I at least, are, am in the habit of thinking of the flesh in the same way that St. Paul speaks of the flesh. St. Paul talks about it as um, uh, the sinful part of us. That's the way he uses that term. But that's not the way St. John uses it. In St. John, the flesh is just the natural, the powerless, the superficial, the merely human. And so the eternal logos became that for us. But in doing so, he turns the flesh into the vessel for the supernatural, for the omnipotent, deep reality, no longer merely human, but profoundly human. The word that is translated dwelt here, and dwelt among us, that actually has a more specific meaning. Literally, the text says that the word lived in a tent among us. It comes from the same word that is used in Greek to refer to the tent of meeting in the Old Testament, the tabernacle, where God dwelt among the Israelites in the desert. This is where the glory of God's presence made Moses' face shine. And so John is saying that Jesus the Christ actually was the presence of God among his people, just as God dwelt with his people in the wilderness. We have beheld his glory, he says. See, just like Moses beheld his glory. We have beheld his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father. And just as God showed undeserved favor to his people in delivering delivering them from slavery in Egypt, so Jesus is full of grace, showing favor to the undeserving, like us. Now, that's a really hard passage of theology. And you may be asking, maybe not, but you may be asking, so what? Right? As Christians, we have heard all of this before. Jesus was both God and man. We got it. Moving on. Right? Well, I'd like to suggest just a few things that come out of this. First, I hope I've given you an idea, an adequate idea, of just how new an idea this really was. This whole system of thought was not something that could have been derived simply by the use of human reason. This is not simply a philosophy. This was the result of the experience of those who lived with Jesus and trusted him and had to work at figuring out what was going on in his life. He fulfilled the expectations of the Old Testament. They saw that. He was the Messiah. But not in the way that anyone expected And so these new thoughts about God are the result of this amazing, life-changing, earth-shaking encounter with the living God in the flesh. Remember that this may be partly the fruit of talking with Mary about who Jesus is. Secondly, no account of the Christian revelation can be adequate if it doesn't begin with and center on this reality of the word made flesh, the incarnation of Jesus Christ, the eternal second person of the Holy Trinity, truly God and truly man, is the very heart and soul of our faith. That's why we fought over it for the first 400 years of our existence, to try and, try and figure that out and nail it down. Jesus is the one who has revealed the Father to us. 
We do not find ultimate reality in philosophies or systems, no matter, no matter how much we may value clear thinking, and you know I do. We don't find ultimate reality in that clear thinking. We find ultimate reality in the life and person of a particular human being who happens to have lived historically in the Roman provinces of Galilee and Judea about 2,000 years ago and who also happens to have been God in the flesh. And therefore, we don't find the meaning of our lives merely in ritual or in philosophy or even in morality. We find the meaning of our lives in a relationship with that man, Jesus, the eternal Son of God. And that leads to my final point, which is this. Our Lord came into the world to give us something. We find that something in this same passage, and it's sandwiched between those two great outrages that I started off with, the outrage of the eternal word and the outrage of the incarnation of that same eternal word. St. John says, but to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. What we are offered is new birth, a new life. To become children again, not in the flesh, to merely human parents, we've done that already. But to start an absolutely new life with God as our Father. We often speak of the whole human race as children of God, but that's really not true. All of us are God's creatures, and God loves us all. But to become children of God is reserved for those who have received the incarnate word. Only those who have trusted in his name. And in this context, the name is not merely a word, It is the word. It's our connection with the person of Jesus. To believe in his name is to trust him in everything that he says about himself and who he is. It's to enter into that relationship that will give meaning to our lives. It's to obey everything he tells us in the Bible and to welcome his continued presence and power and authority in our lives through the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.